Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. As tensions between the U.S. and China heat up over Taiwan, the media is portraying the situation in one-sided terms. Everything the U.S. does, from opening a new China unit at the CIA, to militarizing the South China Sea, to secretly training the Taiwanese military, is depicted as defensive, while everything China does is framed as menacing, aggressive, and authoritarian. And all this as a majority of Americans now favor U.S. military intervention to defend Taiwan from an allegedly looming Chinese invasion. But there's a history that's being totally left out of the coverage. How did Taiwan come to be? Is it a part of China? How has the U.S. used Taiwan as a weapon against China, both historically and today? Is there a similar situation with Tibet, with Xinjiang, with Hong Kong? Is this really about supporting self-determination and independence? Or is this part of a strategy by the U.S. to break up and weaken its greatest adversary? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Ken Hammond, professor of East Asian and global history at New Mexico State University and an activist with the organization Pivot to Peace. Ken, welcome. Glad to be here. Well, I'm really glad to have you on to talk about this very important issue. Um, but just a quick reminder for those who are watching and listening, you can listen to every episode of Dispatches anywhere you get podcasts. And for those who are just listening, you can watch every episode on the Breakthrough News YouTube channel. And if you like this show, you can support all of our programming by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. And now, Ken, to the topic at hand. I guess a good place to start um, would be history. So can you explain the history of Taiwan and its relationship to China, as well as the role of Japanese imperialism? Uh, and then we kind of we can kind of get into the post-World War II era. Sure thing. Sure thing. I mean, Taiwan, Taiwan's connection to China, Taiwan has been a part of, uh, of China uh, for many, many centuries. Uh, a lot of settlers from South China began to cross the straits and uh, begin uh, farming on the island. Oh, maybe in the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, so it's been it's been quite a long time. Um, by the late Ming Dynasty, by the 16th, 17th century, uh, Taiwan was increasingly connected and integrated into uh, the mainland economy. Uh, there was a lot of uh, movement back and forth across the strait. When the Ming Dynasty fell in 1644, loyalists uh, actually went over to Taiwan and held out there for about another 20 years. But then the island was incorporated into the Qing Dynasty, the last of the imperial dynasties, all down through the rest of the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. For a long time, it was part of uh, Fujian province, which is the province directly across the straits on the mainland. But it became a province in its own right uh, in 1886, and so that, you know, that was as fully integrated as it could possibly be. Then, of course, in 1895, uh, as part of the settlement of the first Sino-Japanese War, uh, Taiwan was ceded to Japan and became part of uh, the Japanese Empire. So for the next 50 years, the island was, was part of Japan. Uh, and uh, it was administered uh, by the Japanese. Uh, Japanese language was used in the schools. Uh, all higher education was conducted in Japan. If you graduated from high school in Taiwan and wanted to go to university, you had to go to Japan. So that left a very strong impression on the uh, on the culture of the island and and we should also note that the even with this long integration of taiwan into uh, uh, uh chinese states centered on the mainland uh there was even before chinese migrants began to go over there was an indigenous population mm. uh and those people are also still on the island mostly living up in the more mountainous parts of the east coast uh so the 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 history of the island has some some internal complexities as well. And then, you know, uh, you get to obviously the Japanese, I'm sorry, the Chinese Civil War. And I mean, I guess this is kind of where we can situate a historical part of Taiwan that continues today. So can you describe 
the Chinese Civil War, and then how who declared control over Taiwan following that, and who were the two sides here? Sure, sure. Well, you know, World War II uh, comes to an end in August of 1945, and and the Japanese, uh, uh, you know, surrender, and and in September they sign a formal document of surrender, and in that document, um, sort of diplomatic or political language that had been. Uh, 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 put together by the Allies during the war uh, is incorporated things from from the Cairo Declaration, the Potsdam Declaration, these various big you know summit sort of meetings. Uh, but all of those uh, uh, had agreed that when the war was over, uh, Japan would essentially be stripped of all the territories that it had acquired. Uh, through its its expansionist campaigns in the late 19th and, and the first half of the 20th century. And that explicitly included uh, what at that time they called Formosa, the, the Portuguese name for the island. Um, uh, but uh, that was uh, Japanese control over Formosa would no longer uh, be in place. And so uh, uh, Taiwan, the island, would revert then to uh, to being part of China. Uh, go back to the, the status it had held prior to uh, the, the 1895 treaty. So Taiwan becomes again part of China, but mm -hmm. it does so at a time when China itself is, as you mentioned, going through this, this civil war. With the end of the Japanese occupation, the, the conflict between the nationalist government and the communist revolution resumes. There had been a sort of united front during the war to resist Japan. But now that, that question of who's going to be in control of, uh, of the mainland uh, uh, really, really reemerges. Uh, there's a brief period of negotiations uh, trying to come up with a formula perhaps for a coalition government, but that breaks down fairly quickly. And by 1947, 1948, the civil war between the nationalists and the communists is fought out. And the culmination of that uh, in the winter of 48 to 49 is that the nationalist forces essentially collapse, uh, just too much uh, corruption and, and low morale and, and just uh, the communist, uh, the Red Army has the support of the people and, and they basically just just sweep the nationalist forces from the, from the field. Um, it's during that period at the, in 1948 and 49 that the nationalists decide to withdraw uh, to Taiwan. Uh, this was not a popular move amongst the, the existing Chinese communities on Taiwan. There was a rebellion, an uprising against the nationalists in uh, early in 1948 that was put down. So that, that set the stage then for the ongoing nationalist occupation. Uh, by the end of, well, by the summer of 1949, most of the nationalist forces had been withdrawn from the mainland and uh, they occupied Taiwan and, and declared that that would be the seat of the Republic of China. The mainland, of course, was uh, uh, brought under the leadership of, uh, of the Communist Party and the new government, the People's Republic, that was proclaimed in October of 49. And it's at that point that uh, the intervention of the United States begins to be a critical factor because mm. the U.S. Navy sends uh, 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 naval vessels into the Strait of Taiwan to interpose American military power between the island and the mainland. Uh, and that, of course, uh, protects the, the, the remnants of the nationalists on the island. Uh, and it, uh, it prevents at that time the reunification or the, 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 the final incorporation of Taiwan into the administration of the People's Republic. And of course, that's, that's a situation which has persisted all the way down to the present day. So basically, Taiwan becomes this like kind of imperial outpost where these nationalists fled to after losing the Chinese Civil War to the communists. And I want, I want to talk to you about this. They even represented China at the UN Security Council, and we can get into that. But first, I am curious, just did those right-wing nationalist elements, what role did they play during World War II? Was there like any collaboration with fascist Japan, or were they all against fascist Japan? Well, during the war, um, the, the nationalists in, in China uh, fought fought pretty seriously against the Japanese invasion. Uh, uh, we can think of Japan, or we, I'm sorry, we can think of China during the war as, as kind of two, two distinct 
uh, theaters of operations. In the north, uh, the northern part of, of, of China proper, the, the sort of agricultural heartland of China, is occupied by the Japanese from 1937 on. And it's in that area that, uh, that the Red Army, the communist uh, forces, fought but most of southern China remained in the hands of the nationalists. And the nationalists did put up a, a pretty good defensive struggle. But it has to also be said that Chiang Kai-shek never really accepted the, the primacy of the resistance to Japan. He, he didn't collaborate with the Japanese, but he did not wage a, a war against the Japanese as, uh, how shall we say, as thoroughly or as effectively as perhaps could have been done because he wanted to save up, he wanted to, to, to hoard military supplies and equipment for what he understood would be the eventual confrontation with, uh, with the communists. And so uh, he was criticized for this by the American military liaison, uh, Joseph Stilwell. Uh, and in fact, uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, maneuvered with uh, uh, political allies in Washington to get Stilwell recalled eventually. So he, he, he had his own agenda. Uh, so it, it isn't that the nationalists you know, didn't really resist the, the, the Japanese, but they didn't do so how shall we say, wholeheartedly. And Chiang Kai-shek always kept his eye on, the, uh, on the, the future fight against the communists, even though when it came down to that, uh, he was unable to, to effectively resist the power of the revolution, uh, the support that the communists had amongst the, the, the population, the ordinary people of China, and the corruption that uh, plagued his own system was so devastating that, that the nationalist forces really just, just disintegrated. So all that said, Ken, you know, in the popular American imagination, as you know, Taiwan is portrayed as this like liberal democracy surrounded by this big authoritarian communist Chinese menace. And I, I know that now today, Taiwan has more of a democratic system, but that wasn't always the case. What was the system of governance in Taiwan over the years? Well, from, from 1948, when uh, the nationalists put down this, this uh, rebellion of, of the Taiwanese people who didn't really want to have the, uh, their island occupied by, by the nationalist forces, uh, until 1993, Taiwan was under martial law. Uh, so although there, there were the trappings of, uh, of some sort of uh, democratic uh, uh, state, they had a, a legislature and all that, it, it didn't really have any, any meaningful power. And it was, the, it was the nationalist military that continued to dominate the island. National, uh, the nationalists lifted that martial law in 1993. Chiang Kai-shek had died a few years earlier. Uh, his son, Zhang Jinghuo, was the, the president at that point. Uh, but they finally lifted those restrictions. And indeed, Taiwan has, has developed uh, an, an electoral system. It has a, uh, uh, a multi-party, a three-party, basically, system. Uh, the nationalists have often been the, the, the ruling party, but others, like right now, the, the Democrats, Democratic People's Party, as it calls itself, uh, the president comes from that uh, that party. Uh, so there, there is, uh, you know, there are elections, but of course, uh, as in as in you know, capitalist electoral systems in general, it's those with with wealth uh, and and, uh, and and shall we say uh, private resources that are able to dominate and manipulate the electoral process. It's not. Uh, uh, you know, not surprising to see uh, the interests of, of the business community and the interests of, uh, of, of the wealthy elite uh, be the, the, the shaping force in, in Taiwanese domestic politics. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty characteristic of this kind of, of uh, you know, what they call liberal uh, democratic system. But now to go back to that issue I mentioned with the UN Security Council, I mean, this is fascinating. And I think most people especially my age don't know this, that Taiwan had the seat on the UN Security Council representing China, despite the fact that mainland China had like, or has a fifth of the world's population, while Taiwan's population at the time was less than 20 million, yet Taiwan was considered the representative of China. So how did that happen? How is it that Taiwan, this island that historically belonged to China, ended up being the representative of this massive country it didn't actually control at the UN Security Council. Yeah, that's a legacy of, of World War II, basically. Uh, during the war, uh, the Allied powers were the United States, France, Britain, the Soviet Union, 
and China. China was considered, because it was such a, a, a big theater of war, uh, tying down a million Japanese troops uh, in order to, in some ways, to keep Chiang Kai-shek happy. Uh, he was invited to the big uh, allied conferences, uh, and, uh, and the, the Chinese were considered to be one of the, of the allied powers, the main allied powers. When the war is over, uh, that status just just carried on, and the initial the initial meetings and plans to uh, to establish the United Nations uh, included uh, the five uh, uh, permanent members of the of the Security Council, which were the victorious allies: the U.S., Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and China. And at that time, the nationalist government was still, uh, at least formally, the the government over the whole country. When uh, when the revolution comes to power in 1949 and the People's Republic is proclaimed, uh, interestingly, uh, uh, the other uh, allied powers, the other permanent members of the Security Council, Britain, France and the Soviet Union, all recognized the new government in Beijing uh, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, only the United States refused to recognize the People's Republic. Uh, this was a, 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 a position, a posture that the United States had adopted uh, in, in its relationship with, uh, with Asian countries for a long time, what they called the non-recognition. We're not going to recognize your actions. So when Japan invaded Manchuria in 1931 and established the, its puppet uh, government there, the United States simply said, we're not going to recognize it. They didn't do anything about it. But but they didn't recognize it. So the same policy is applied in 1949. And because of that, and because the United States basically at that point was the dominant power within the UN, uh, Taiwan simply, the, the Republic of China, which was the nationalist rump on Taiwan, simply remained in possession of the, the United Nations seat uh, in the General Assembly, in the Security Council, and as, a, as a, a permanent member of the Security Council. So that legacy persists until uh, actually just 50 years ago, I think either yesterday or the day before, that was the anniversary mm -hmm. of China uh, assuming its, uh, its proper seat. Uh, the, the General Assembly, uh, the United States had always vetoed uh, votes about uh, uh, bringing China in and, and taking Taiwan out. The United States had always vetoed that. But in 1971, while secret negotiations were going on to, in prepa uh, preparation for Nixon's visit the next February, uh, the U.S. let it be known that it would not veto uh, such a vote at this time. And so uh, that allowed the, the vast majority of the membership of the UN to, uh, to pass the, the measures that, that, uh, that expelled Taiwan and granted the seat as it, as it should have been all along to the People's Republic. And so, wh so what is, I guess here's where we can talk about, what is the one China policy? That's when this policy by the US was recognized. Um, so why did the US uh, go along with the one China policy in the seventies, like what shifted, um, what does that mean? And then also the U S pursued with regard to Taiwan, this policy of what they called strategic ambiguity. So I guess, can you define what's the one China policy and what does this strategic ambiguity mean? Well, the, the one China policy is, is, is simply a statement that, that, and this comes out of out of uh, the the Shanghai communique uh, in February of uh, 1972 at the end of uh, President Nixon's visit to China, and basically the One China policy says that uh, uh, both that people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait agree that there is only one China and that Taiwan is a part of China. Uh, and, and that, of course, is the official position, both of the government in Beijing and of the local authorities on Taiwan. Uh, if, you, if you're on Taiwan or you're in Taiwan and you go to a, a bookstore and you buy a map of China, it shows the whole country. Now, mm. it, it shows, you know, Taiwan and, and the mainland as being part of, of the Republic of China. If you buy a map uh, in a bookstore in Shanghai or Beijing or Wuhan, you're going to get a map that shows all of China with Taiwan as a province of China. Uh, so both sides agree. And that's that's the basis of the one China mm. policy. Uh, 
Mm. But the strategic ambiguity is the way that that position is incorporated into these statements. The Shanghai communique in 80, in, uh, in 72 and the official uh, statement that, that is made in 1979 when the United States and China uh, agree to establish formal diplomatic relations, exchange ambassadors, establish embassies, all that. Because in both of those documents, the, what the phrasing says is the United States government acknowledges that it is the position of people on both sides of the strait, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It doesn't technically say the United States government believes that there is only one China and that Taiwan is part of China. It says the United States acknowledges that that's what everybody in China on both sides of the straits says. So it leaves it can be it can be said that there's a little wiggle room in there. It doesn't really seem if everybody on the ground in in China and on Taiwan uh, uh, agrees, then uh, I'm not sure why the United States should be in a position of saying there's something ambiguous about this. But given the the agendas of American politicians, that's mm. how that's how that gets manipulated. You know, that's so interesting because actually I never thought about this way, but Taiwan, of course, at one point did get to like the government sitting in Taiwan, the nationalist government did get to like represent all of China to the world because the U.S. said so at the U.N. Security Council. So you, so today when you talk about going and looking at maps and bookstores, they still see themselves as the representative of all of China. Yes, yes. The Republic, okay. the, 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 the local authorities on Taiwan call themselves the Republic of China. The money says Republic of China. The, the hmm. you know, their passports say Republic of China. They are the legally the, the, the descendants of the government that had been in place uh, until 1949. Uh, they have remained in possession and occupation of that island. Uh, and they still claim to be the government of all of China. It's interesting because, you know, there there are certain issues in the world these days, like uh, like the question of the South China Seas. And uh, if you buy a map of, of China in Taiwan, it shows exactly the same territorial claims as the, as a map you would buy on the mainland. Uh, the 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 so-called nine dash line that demarcates the area that that China claims in the South China Sea. You get this exactly the same thing in Taiwan as you do in, in Beijing, because both of those uh, uh, administrations uh, assert that they are the legitimate government of the whole country. <laughs> so this goes beyond just like a separatist movement, like it, it goes beyond Hong Kong or, you know, maybe the separatists in Xinjiang or any of these other Tibet territories. It's actually that's actually even more interesting because you're talking about a group that actually believes everything belongs to them, despite being on this small island. But, you know, going back to the one China policy, the U.S. abided by it for decades after normalization in the 1970s, like you explained. But obviously, with this new Cold War heating up, that's very much changing. We hear Biden saying that the U.S. is going to defend Taiwan from China, even using, you know, the U.S. military to do so. And then we recently learned that the CIA, I'm sorry, not the CIA, that special operations forces in the U.S. Marines uh, have been in Taiwan for at least the yet last year training their military forces. Um, and, you know, it's just you could imagine how America might react if they learn that Chinese military personnel were training, you know, people in like Puerto Rico or Hawaii or just even like, you know, the U.S. freaks out even when like a, an Iranian ship is in Latin America. Like they just they freak out when Iran or China does trade with a nearby country. So they would definitely freak out if China was actually like training people who wanted to separate from the U.S. That said, you know, why is the U.S. doing this? And what is the danger here? Well, the danger, uh, the danger is great. The danger is that that the situation across the Taiwan Straits could uh, somehow uh, erupt into an actual uh, violent confrontation. There could be, you know, shots exchanged, as they say, and that could escalate into a 
uh, a major military conflict. I don't think that that's likely to happen. I think that it's certainly not in the interests of anyone in Taiwan or anyone in the People's Republic uh, uh, to to have conflict. Uh, you know, the 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 economies of of of, uh, of Taiwan and and the rest of the country are are deeply integrated. Uh, there are there are you know hundreds of billions of dollars invested across the straits both ways, uh, money from the mainland coming to Taiwan, money from Taiwan going to the mainland. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of of, uh, of people from Taiwan who are living and working on the mainland uh, as part of, uh, of commercial operations. Uh, there's a, there's a huge flow of tourism uh, both ways across the straits. It would be it would be absurd. It would be almost suicidal for, for, for both sides, should there actually be uh, a, a war across the Taiwan Straits. And, and it's not the mainland. You know, we, we, we see these headlines about, oh, China's bullying Taiwan and China's, you know, ramping up the threat. And that's just nonsense. If, if, you, if you read what the Chinese say and look at what the Chinese do, uh, it's clear that that they don't want any kind of military uh, confrontation across the straits. They will not tolerate uh, uh, people intervening, people interfering in that relationship. And that's why every time the Americans make some provocative statement, the Chinese have to make a counter statement. But the reality is that that the, the People's Liberation Army is not chomping at the bit waiting to, to leap across the strait. Uh, it's much better for that relationship to continue. As Xi Jinping said uh, at the beginning of October in a, in a speech, October 9th, this is a matter, this is a problem, this is a question uh, for the Chinese people, for all the Chinese people on both sides of the strait. And it mm -hmm. needs to be resolved by them in their own way, in their own time. Uh, so it's, it's not it's not. Xi Jinping or the government of the People's Republic that's ramping up the tensions here. It's American politicians with, you know, uh, with their own agendas. It's easy. It's a cheap shot. It's something that an American, you know, congressional candidate or a senatorial candidate or even a presidential candidate can get up and pontificate about and be the tough guy and talk about how we're going to teach those commies a lesson and all that. And, and it, 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 it's popular. It gets uh, it, it resonates. It might notch up your your polls a point or two, but it's super dangerous and it's entirely yeah. irresponsible uh, because it's 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 not in anybody's interest for that to happen. The best thing possible is for the situation to continue to evolve, to develop, and to allow the the, the convergence between Taiwan and the and the mainland to to progress in in its own way and in its own time. And I'm curious, what is the role of the government in Taiwan? What role do, do its law? Because I know it has a pretty big lobbying apparatus in the U.S. Um, are they playing a role in this escalation or do you, would you really just place it only in it's just the U.S. doing this? Well, I think it's primarily the U.S., but of course, there are elements in Taiwan, uh, again, for their own uh, uh, sort of political agendas and, and uh, uh, manipulating the, the electoral process there. Um, that that talk about uh, taking a tough line with uh, with the PRC and and uh, uh, you know even even flirting with with language about independence and things like that. Of course, an independent Taiwan would would you know cut itself off from its number one trading partner uh, and forfeit a lot of the benefits that have accrued to it over the last twenty or thirty years. So I don't I don't think any rational person on Taiwan really wants to have it be uh, uh, independent in that sense from from the mainland. Uh, but there are elements in Taiwan that uh, that that have their own agendas that 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 feed into and, and can align with these uh, these American uh, this, this these American political flourishes, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that that represents the 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 interests, certainly, or or the the will of the, the vast majority of the people in Taiwan. People in Taiwan want to go about their lives. They're, they're just like people everywhere. They want to live their lives. They want to have security. And, and all this saber rattling uh, uh, by, by the Americans is, is, is really just not, not helpful. I mean, I'm curious, just very briefly, like in Taiwan itself, um, 
is there a debate about reunification with China? Like, what can we tell about what the residents of Taiwan want, judging by the parties for whom they vote? And can sure. you imagine, and can also, can you imagine a reunified, a reunified Taiwan and mainland China? Well, I can certainly imagine that. Uh, you know, China has has uh, uh, consistently enunciated a policy of, uh, you know, one country, two systems. Uh, they've been very clear that, uh, you know, the the they understand that that Taiwan has had its own particular historical trajectory, that it has a political culture which is uh, distinct from that of the mainland. Uh, they might, over over a long period of time, converge to to uh, a significant degree. But certainly at this point and and going forward, I mean, if if the local authorities in Taiwan were to issue a statement tomorrow, saying that you know we we recognize that Taiwan is indeed a part of the People's Republic, if that were to happen, if the if the Taiwan authorities were to make that kind of statement. Um, that wouldn't result in in Taiwan suddenly becoming just like I don't know Henan Province or or Shandong Province or something like that. The 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 local situation would remain unchanged, uh, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know whatever negotiations would take place would would spell out the details of all that. But I think that that there's no interest in in imposing uh, conditions on Taiwan that, that would not be popular with, with the people there. But, but that's in a sense, that's not really the issue. The issue is that, that the, that the, the convergence, if that's going to take place has to happen in its, in its own way. It's not going to be something done by fiat on either side, uh, mm. of the straits. You know, I'm, I'm curious, is Taiwanese intransigence partly at least a function of U S support? Like would, would American, would an American decline or maybe the better word is withdrawal from the Pacific lead to an eventual like soft unification or some sort of um, like resolving of this issue? Oh, I think very much so. I think, you know, I mean, it, it's 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 the power of the American military that uh, that underpins the the continued uh divisions between uh, the situation on Taiwan and on the mainland. Uh, you know, recently the U.S. Navy has once again started sending some of its ships through the Taiwan Straits, which is a clear violation of international law uh, since both sides agree that Taiwan is part of China. Uh, you know, those straits are, are Chinese waters. And for the U.S. to just cavalierly cruise back and forth through there, you know, it, uh, as, as you suggested earlier, I don't think they'd be very happy if Chinese ships started sailing around in between the different Hawaiian islands, just saying, hey, you know, we're just here. Uh, I, I think that that would certainly be unacceptable. Unlikely as it may be for uh, the U.S. to really stand down in the Pacific, that that actually that would be good for people all over the region. It would reduce tensions. It would it would allow countries to pursue their own political agendas. Uh, you know, the United States believes that it is the dominant globally hegemonic power. And and, you know, when you get Secretary of State Blinken talking about an international rules based order, what he means is everybody plays by our rules. We make the rules and everybody else has to get along with them. Uh, if that were to change, if 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 countries around the world were able to pursue their own interests without having to always be looking over their shoulder about what are the Americans going to do? How is this going to upset the Americans or, you know, how can we how can we accommodate ourselves to their power? Uh, it would be better for, for people all around the world. You know, uh, uh, China uh, in its in its international relations generally. Uh, has been very consistent about not interfering in the internal affairs of other countries, of trying to develop mutually uh, beneficial relationships. China is not some great philanthropist country, but, you know, it's a country that that uh, is very respectful, given its own history, given the fact that the Chinese people have a, a deep and visceral understanding of what it's like to be dominated by by foreign powers. Uh, they're the last people on earth to want to start imposing that on, on others. And I think that uh, for the U.S. To, to make a graceful exit from the from the region would be uh, would be a good move for all concerned, including for the American people. So we don't continue to have this huge drain of American resources off to off to our, our bloated military establishment. 
And, you know, I think that's a really good, you're, I mean, you're basically distinguishing between um, the U.S. and China's behavior, and it's very, very different. But one thing we constantly hear in the last few weeks when it comes to Taiwan is that, oh, my God, China's like flying planes, more and more planes in the air defense identification zone. Um, and this is being framed as like a form of huge aggression, though, I mean, it seems more like kind of a show of deterrence. Um, if you're looking at it from China's perspective, but yeah, I mean, how would you distinguish the behavior of China in this area versus the U S is China acting aggressively in your opinion at all? Well, I think that, oh, no, I don't think they are. And, and I think that, that, you know, you, you mentioned the, uh, the, 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 the flights that have been, uh, talked about in, in headlines in Western media, Nonsense, uh, yeah. this, yeah, this <laughs> idea of, of, oh, look at China threatening Taiwan, bullying Taiwan. Um, these, these ADIZs, these, these air defense uh, zones uh, are, are interesting. The, the ADIZ that Taiwan claims actually extends a couple of hundred kilometers into Fujian province. So that uh, I read a, a piece just recently that, that pointed out that uh, uh, People's Liberation Army aircraft are violating the ADIZ, the Taiwan ADIZ, when they're sitting on their runways at their bases, because those bases fall within the, uh, uh, the, the claims that, that Taiwan puts out. These, you know, these, these zones are, are just arbitrary spatial constructs that all different countries kind of, kind of proclaim. Uh, and if in, in this region, China, Taiwan, Japan, uh, these they they overlap, uh, and of course the United States flies through all of them, completely ignoring them, uh, doesn't take any notice of them, uh, no matter whose they are, right? So it's it's uh, uh, it, it's kind of crazy. But the, the, even within that, even given that, if you look at the 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 traces of where these mainland where these PLA aircraft have been operating. Uh, it's, it's hundreds of kilometers off the south coast of Taiwan. They're not flying over Taiwan. They're not buzzing, you know, Taipei or something like that. <laughs> they're, they're, still, they're still far away, far away from, uh, from uh, uh, any, kind of, any kind of airspace over the island. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I do think that, that the, uh, the, the authorities on the mainland, the, the government of the People's Republic, wants to be very clear that, uh, that they can conduct these kinds of flights and, and, and they, can, they can, you know, there's a certain amount of signaling going on. But the idea that what they're doing is somehow aggressive and irresponsible and threatening, menacing, you know, you almost get the sense that, that people in, 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 in the cities of Taiwan are looking up at the sky and these, <laughs> You know, oh my God, how terrifying! That, that's just nonsense, you know. And and uh, and I think that that again, uh, uh, more 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 sober minds on on both sides of the straits understand this. You know, Trump was so openly anti-China when he was president, uh, and his I mean his administration was just full of these like anti-China zealots. Uh, and you know, now that we have this new administration under Biden, the rhetoric, of course, is slightly less hostile. He doesn't go around accusing China of like raping America, which is actually something that Trump said repeatedly. Um, however, many of Trump's policies are still in place, like his tariffs. None of those have been removed. Even China was hopeful that by the Biden presidency was going to help de-escalate things a bit. Um to the point where you even had Republicans like accusing Biden of being in bed with China. But so far, looking at this administration's policy um, since January, since it came into power, how does it differ from Trump's or does it his policy towards China? Well, I think I think it does differ, but it's not better. <laughs> hmm. um, That's not good. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that, you know, obviously, President Trump was, uh, 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 shall we say, a colorful figure. Uh, and, 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 and a very flamboyant, uh, actor on the political stage, uh, to the extent that he had a policy towards China, it was, it was pretty hostile, but it was largely focused really on, on economic issues. Mm. Uh, not that those were handled very well. And, and actually all of the policies that he put into place haven't really done much for uh, even for American business, let alone for working people in America. 
But the Biden administration, if anything, um, has uh, has a more consistent and a more focused anti-China policy. Uh, uh, the Biden administration represents, uh, you know, the the sort of liberal face of of imperialism, mm -hmm. uh, and but it's it's a it's a it's a very it's a very consistent face. It, it, Trump, you know, kind of kind of wandered around and, and would go off in one lane, you know, here one day and here the next. The Biden administration is very is very focused, is very consistent. I don't think they actually have a clue about how to to really deal with China, how to really make that relationship work in a in a positive way. And I but I, I think that that the American policy towards China in the last decade has has been pretty bipartisan. You know, if you look at Congress, anti-China speeches, uh, you know, occur on both sides of the aisle all the time because really it's a bipartisan hostility towards China. And I think what that reflects is a deep anxiety on the part of American economic and political elites about the the eroding position of American global dominance. And they can only think in a kind of zero sum way. And so the idea is if China is a growing economy, an increasingly prosperous society, uh, a society that is increasingly engaged with the wider world, that can only mean that, that America's position is going to decline. Mm -hmm. And it may be that America's position is going to decline, but it's not declining because of anything China's doing. It's declining because of its own internal contradictions, its own bad governance, its own inequalities, its own injustices, its own historical legacies. Uh, but American elites don't want to say that. They don't want to say, you know, the, the, the buzzards are coming home to roost. Uh, so they blame it on China. And they, they have this, they, they foster this, this fear and this anxiety about China, that China's, China's taking over, China's taking our, what should be ours, as if the whole world should, be, should belong to the United States. And the Chinese, you know, as you mentioned right at the very beginning, China is one fifth of humanity. One out of every five people on the planet is Chinese. And, you know, they should play a significant role. Throughout most of, of, you know, the history of civilization, China was one of the most advanced, prosperous, sophisticated societies in the world. It's not unreasonable to anticipate that in the future, they're going to return to a role in global affairs not that different from what they occupied until in the 19th century, Western imperialism, the Industrial Revolution, drove a process of humiliation and subordination that, that for a while reshaped global relationships. Now the world is returning to a more balanced, multi-centric order, but the United States wants to hang on to its position as the global hegemon. That's, that's a contradiction that isn't going to be resolved uh, by the kinds of posturing and, and macho threatening that uh, that uh, American politicians indulge in all the time. And it is dangerous, too, because, I mean, even if they don't necessarily want an actual war, I mean, all this militarization of the South China Sea, of the Taiwan Straits, I mean, people don't, you know, wars can happen accidentally. They can start accidentally because there's a collision or some sort of confrontation. And what happens? What happens if a U.S. and Chinese military vessel collide? Um or if two military planes collide. And are there mechanisms, are there proper mechanisms in place to, to even de-escalate that if it were to happen, if some sort of contra confrontation were to accidentally take place? Well, it, you know, of course, on the surface of things, if you if you look at, uh, at 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 what gets said in public and done in public, uh, uh, that might be that might be a pretty questionable uh, proposition. But I think that that we can we can look at a few uh, instances in in the history of the relationship between the U.S. and China that suggest that perhaps uh, there are other other options, other channels that uh, that that can serve uh, a more positive uh, role. For example, uh, all the way back in the 1950s, when the U.S. didn't recognize the government of the PRC, nonetheless there were 
talks that went on on a regular basis in Warsaw, in Poland, between the American ambassador to Poland and the Chinese ambassador to Poland. They would meet basically once a month and just, you know, keep in touch. And in 1958, when the what's called the, the Kimoi and Matsu crisis broke out, uh, uh, when uh, uh, PLA forces were, were shelling these two little islands right off the coast of, of uh, Fujian, um, there was a lot of, you know, uh, strutting and saber rattling in the media, but the the Warsaw talks, the the ambassadorial connection in Warsaw, uh, allowed both sides to say, "All right, look, you know, let's let's not get carried away here. Let's chill this out. You say what you have to say. We'll say what we have to say. But we understand that we're not going to let this get out of control." In the seventies, there was a moment where there were some tensions across the strait, and at that point. Uh, those were resolved not by the, the visit of, of uh, diplomats from both sides uh, having public discussions, but at a dinner party in northern Virginia uh, mm -hmm. at the home of uh, a woman named Pamela Harriman. Pamela Harriman was the widow of, uh, of Averill Harriman, who'd been a great uh, uh, diplomatic uh, representative of the United States with the Soviets and all this. And she had a dinner party at which uh, American military personnel and a Chinese uh, 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 consul from the, from the embassy were guests, and they had informal discussions, and they agreed, again, that both sides would say what they had to say in public, but that in private, things would be, you know, calmed down. And most recently, of course, we have uh, General Milley, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, uh, calling his Chinese counterpart uh, uh, twice uh, in, uh, uh, in November of, uh, of 20 and in January of 21 to say, you know, uh, we're not going to let President Trump in his final days here as part of his 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 freak out uh, launch a, a war with you. You know, so I just want to let you know that that that's not going to happen. We're going to we'll be sure to take whatever steps are necessary to avoid that. So I think that there are these kind of back channel or side channel uh, uh, things. But but of course, that's all very informal. And and, you know, it's it, the, the the ability for that to happen is dependent upon goodwill. Uh, by at least some individuals on 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 both sides, and I think that that uh, as the public rhetoric and the and the political posturing gets more and more intense and more and more menacing, it makes it difficult for for conflicts to get resolved. People, you know, people are going to be saying, "Well, you know, this situation was so bad. Why didn't you, in the end, why didn't you do something about it?" Uh, so it, you know, people paint themselves, politicians paint themselves into a corner, and then it that that makes it increase difficult to, to find even these sort of quieter, more, more back channel kinds of resolutions. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, it's still good to know that sometimes cooler heads prevail, but there is that danger there, like you mentioned. I want to, I want to just shift gears very briefly uh, to talk about a different area of China, which is Tibet, which is also this popular cause in the West and the Dalai Lama is sort of like revered as this wise elder. Um, but this is a kind. This is like another scam narrative that we get here. Um, <laughs> I don't know. How else to, it's a scam. It's, it really is such a scam because, you know, what actually is the case with Tibet is it could also be seen as this feudal society with a deeply oppressive religious hierarchy, resisting Chinese attempts to modernize. And you can correct me if I'm wrong with that. But can you just give a brief overview of what you think people should understand? about who the U.S. supports in Tibet and then why they support them. Sure. Well, the, the, the question of Tibet, of course, is a it's a it's a complex one in some ways, but it's also in other ways, it's really a very simple one. Um, you know, Tibet was a, a theocratic state, which is to say that uh, it had a, a an established religion, the, the, the Tibetan uh, form of Buddhism. Uh, it uh, uh, the the head of state was the head of the of the religion the Dalai Lama, and um, you know it, it was not it wasn't permissible to not be part of that religious establishment. You know, so I don't think most people in the West would really want to live in a society where you had to conform to a religious orthodoxy. Uh, uh, you know, and that was that was a legally binding obligation. But that was the case in Tibet. Um, and the given that the monasteries were the the economically dominant powers in the country, 
The monasteries own tremendous amounts of land. Uh, mm. They uh, a huge proportion of the of the male population uh, existed as monks. Uh, many of them uh, laboring on that land, but also private farmers worked on that land in order to support the monasteries. So the monasteries had had tremendous economic and political interests, which dominated Tibetan society for hundreds of years. After the establishment of the People's Republic, 1949-1950, Tibet, which had been part of the Qing dynasty for hundreds of years, it had had uh, a long and intimate relationship with imperial China. Uh, uh, it had been part of the Republic of China, although the authority of the central government was was weak there. Uh, but uh, Tibet had always been in the modern period legally recognized internationally as a part of, of China. So in 1950, the, the Chinese central government extended its authority over Tibet. But they did so in a way that that really sought to accommodate local interests. The, the Dalai Lama visited Beijing, met with Chairman Mao, uh, negotiations took place, and, uh, and agreements were reached under which Tibet, as an autonomous region within the People's Republic, uh, was, uh, was able to pursue its own agenda. Uh, it was not, for example, land reform that was carried out so effectively across most of China uh, did not take place within Tibet. Uh, uh, other policies of the central government uh, involved with uh, the beginnings of the process of developing a modern industrial socialist economy did not apply in Tibet. Uh, and that was the case all the way through the 1950s. But even while that was the case, the United States, as part of its relentless uh, uh, hostility towards China, maintained a program based just, I live in New Mexico here in America, and just the next state north is Colorado. And the, the CIA ran a training facility up in the mountains of Colorado uh, from 1950 until uh, 1974, training uh, Tibetan terrorists to be infiltrated into Tibet, uh, either going overland from Nepal or being airdropped in. And, uh, and they carried out sabotage and political ag agitation and things like that. They helped to provoke in 1959 the revolt, uh, which was the occasion when the Dalai Lama left Tibet and went to India, where he's remained ever since. Um, and that, uh, that, that triggered uh, a stronger assertion of central government authority, because here you had this, this rebellion fomented by the United States uh, trying to split a big chunk of China away from, from the central government. So, you know, that, that, that certainly complicated the relationship. In more recent times, the unrest that has occurred in Tibet, and, and there have been occasions of this, I think is largely... It's, it's a result of the, the, the lingering ambitions or hopes of the monastic establishments to try to reclaim a certain more influential role within Tibet. Uh, the monasteries are facing some, some serious problems. Uh, their ability to recruit young men to become monks and, and live their lives uh, as monks has, has been dramatically eroded. Most young people in Tibet, especially in the, the cities and towns, they don't want to be monks. Mm. Uh, they, they, want to, they want to live their lives. They want to have education. They want to have jobs. They want to, you know, they want to have their iPhone and their, and their I don't know, their, their <laughs> Atlanta Braves t-shirt, whatever it might be. You know, they, they want to be part of modern culture, modern society, a modern economy. Uh, so the monasteries are, are facing a, a kind of a kind of crisis. And I think that the agitation that has taken place uh, is a is an expression of that in the same way. You know, I, I, I when I talk to Americans about this, I talk about how, you know, I, I lived uh, many years in Boston. And, and one of the things you, you face in Boston is that the Catholic Church is shutting down all over the city. You know, this mm. is a city of Italians, of, of Irishmen. It's a city where, where historically the Catholic Church has been very important. But the church can't find enough young people to become, you know, uh, priests and, and nuns. Uh, and so they're, you know, they're having to shut down these, these establishments. It's the same thing in right. Tibet. Right. And the monasteries are, in a sense, they're pushing back. And that 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 leads to these tensions. But if you think about it, the fact that the monasteries are there 
that they're full of monks, you know, uh, maybe not as many as they used to have. Maybe they're having trouble recruiting, but they're there. You go to Lhasa. I, I travel to Tibet whenever I can. And, and you go to Lhasa, you see the pilgrims coming from all over the country. They're perambulating around the Jokong. You know, they're they're prostrating themselves. They're doing all the things that, that historically <laughs> Tibetan Buddhists have done. Uh, you know, you go to Shigatse or Gyanse, some of the other religious centers. They're very lively. They're very full. The idea that 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 the Tibetan people live under some, you know, regime of terror and that religion is suppressed and free, it's just nonsense. Mm. But but they rely the 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 American media, the bourgeois media, relies on the fact that most people don't have any experience of that, and and it's right. so easy to buy into that. You hear that, and the Dalai Lama, you know, he's a charming old gentleman now, you know, and he goes out and he does his talks, and who can argue with you know with <laughs> things? You know, he says we should feel compassion for others. We should you know we should recognize the ephemerality of our being. Okay, great, but you know. <laughs> That doesn't mean that doesn't that doesn't translate into into the the, the propaganda stories that we hear about mm -hmm. the situation in Tibet. It's just you have to understand that as a political phenomenon, uh, that there are contending interests even you know within Tibet, and that uh, you know sometimes uh, there's there's friction and tension, uh, and and things have to have to be adjusted and resolved. But this idea that 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 it's just this 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 regime of terror it's just nonsense and all you have to do uh, uh you know is is have the opportunity to see the reality on the ground there and it and it becomes a very different a very different picture yeah i mean i think that you, what you were talking about sounds like you can be applied all over the world actually which is like younger people just aren't as interested in religion it's pretty universal for the most part it's it's um, the modern world yeah yeah yeah. Um, so, you know, in, the reason I bring up Tibet is also to note, like, this kind of broader pattern with U.S. policy. Um, and I actually want to quote from a specific book. Uh, it's called Destined for War, Can America Escape the, the Thucydides Trap? And it's sure. by Harvard foreign policy analyst Graham Allison. This is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. His work has been praised by Biden and others in the U.S. establishment and military apparatus, for that matter. And he wrote the following about China, which many pe you know, people have pointed out, and I think it's important to, to quote the specific part. He writes, U.S. forces could covertly train and support separatist insurgents. Fissures in the Chinese state already exist. Tibet is essentially occupied territory. Xinjiang, a traditionally Islamic region in Western China, already harbors an active Uyghur separatist movement responsible for waging a low-level insurgency against Beijing. And Taiwanese, who watch Beijing's heavy-handedness in Hong Kong, hardly require encouragement to oppose reunification with this increasingly authoritarian government. Could U.S. support for these separatists draw Beijing into conflicts with radical Islamist groups throughout Central Asia and the Middle East? If so, could these become quagmires mirroring the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan? Uh, when he talks about the Mujahideen, and then he says, a subtle but concentrated effort to accentuate the contradictions at the core of the Chinese communist ideology could over time undermine the regime and encourage independence movement in, in Taiwan, Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong by splintering China at home and keeping Beijing embroiled and maintaining domestic stability, the U.S. could avert or at least substantially delay China's challenge to American dominance. So I, I quote this just to say, I mean, when you see it spelled out so openly and then you look at U.S. policy when it comes to Taiwan, Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong, it's hard not to conclude that the U.S. is trying or is on some level trying to balkanize China to weaken it as a matter of policy under this guise of promoting democracy, which is what China does accuse the U.S. of. So wh what do you think about this accusation, especially when you see writing that like that? Well, you know, Graham Allison basically is a is a spokesperson for the <laughs> for the the political elite here in the United States. Uh, you know, he. 
I think that's a, a very clear and concise articulation of, uh, you know, what, what we might think of today as as the American dream. You know, that uh, that uh, uh, they have this 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 mindset about China uh, as if in some way it's uh, it's you know it, it's a Stalinist uh, state from 1937 uh, hmm. rather than you know one of the most prosperous uh, societies in the world today uh, that is taking significant steps to address uh, uh, you know economic inequality uh, you know issues of, of public health, uh, you know, it's a it's a country that is that that is caring for its people. It's a country, for example, in the in the COVID era that has had fewer than five thousand deaths compared to over seven hundred thirty thousand in America, with only a quarter of the population. So, you know, I think that that the 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 ambition, the hope of of American elites, as as he says right at the end of that statement, is to preserve American dominance. And, yeah. and, you know, they never ask the question, why should America be dominant? Why does somebody have to be dominant? Why can't we have a world in which countries are able to, to go their own way and pursue their interests uh, and develop themselves and, and perhaps participate in, in, in shared common prosperity, as the Chinese are talking about these days? I think that, that you know, that, that vision, that the whole idea that, that Allison uh, emphasizes, this idea of the Thucydides trap, that history is just a sequence of one dominant power being supplanted by another, and that usually erupts into violence and warfare, uh, you know, that, that's a, I think that, A, I think that's a misreading of history, uh, but I also think that it's, it's kind of a, a, a wish fulfillment uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that the United States is somehow going to to uh, escape from from you know from its decline. Uh, you know the United States has had a really good run. It's been a dominant <laughs> power, but economically, uh, history is it shows that that change is also part of the natural process of things. Uh, you know China's rise is is not a menace. It's not a threat. It's just it's just a return to a more balanced global system. If the average Chinese worker becomes, as they are becoming, just averagely productive in terms of, of economic activity, you know, there's four times as many workers in China as there are in America. So the Chinese economy eventually should be four times bigger than that of right. America. That's not because they're doing anything wrong. They're not doing anything menacing. They're not like economic supermen. That's just ordinary average activity. But given the, the demographics, you know, the size of populations, the size of territory, the resource bases, it's not, I mean, China has always been a leading economy in the world. It's, it's, it's only common sense that that would return, that that situation would return now that the monopoly that the Western powers had on industrial technology no longer exists. That technology is diffused around the world. And so other countries can, can rise to the same levels of productivity. They can enrich their own people. They can improve mm -hmm. the lives of their people. We face deep ecological challenges in that process. But the Chinese are, are aware of that and are trying to address that as well, more responsibly than the United States is. You know, so... I, I think that, that Graham Allison's uh, uh, statement, it's a remarkable exercise in, in honesty, we have to say. He says it, he's telling it like, like they see it. But I think that it's, a, it's also a, a, a depressing and, and kind of shameful articulation of, of the, 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 the greed and the, uh, the, the ego that underpins uh, you know, America's relationship with with basically everybody else on the planet. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned we're facing this ecological catastrophe and I will say, you know, I, I live in the Middle East and I mean, the country I'm in as well as countries around me have been completely destroyed uh, ecologically, societally, not by China, but by America's obsession with dominating the world. So uh, a decline in that dominance, I think would be a good thing for many regions of the world and particularly for the climate, for the planet. Um, but, you know, as we're coming to the end here, I wanted to ask you as an academic who you're very open about your opinion on this stuff. And I imagine 
you know, I hope I would like to think that your opinion is the common one, <laughs> but increasingly, right, increasingly we see that this hostility towards China, we're being inculcated to see China as this enemy, this menace. I'm just curious, are there any like repercussions um, for speaking out against this new Cold War on China in the academic environment in the way that you have? Um I don't think that that's been an issue so far for, that's good. <laughs> for well, I was going to say for, for people like me. Um, mm. There has, of course, uh, there's been a uh, an extensive campaign by the Justice Department here in the United States against uh, uh, Chinese scholars, against either uh, scholars from China who have come to, to do research in America, but also uh, of American-born people of, of Chinese ancestry. There have been numerous prosecutions, arrests by the FBI, uh, a lot of headline generating activity. In most of those cases, those charges have wound up being dropped uh, very quietly. That doesn't get headlines. Uh, but but that campaign against against Chinese scholars or Chinese American scholars has gained a lot of a lot of notoriety. And I think that uh, that that's unfortunate. But within academia, um, I, I, I wish that uh, uh, that we could we could say that uh, the the views that I tend to express are are the common ones, but I, I fear that they are not. Uh, uh, there has been uh, uh, there's a tendency in in uh, at least in American academic circles uh, to to take kind of a uh, I, I suppose it's 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 meant to be a more even-handed approach, which is to say that I, I think a lot of a lot of uh, academics, uh, for for whatever reasons, and and I don't want to speculate too much on people's uh, you know individual motivations, but um, accept the idea or 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 buy into the idea that China has become a capitalist society, uh, that mm. it's it's behaving globally as a sometimes called a neo-colonialist or neo-imperialist society, um, that it is authoritarian and domestically oppressive. And, and, and so I think a lot of people uh, in academia, again, uh, uh, kind of have a, a almost a, a pox on both their houses, you know, that, that many people, I mean, there's a lot of people in academia who are very critical of American imperialism, who understand that America's role in the world is very problematic, but they're not ready to, to, you know, take a more, a more positive posture towards China. I think in part because they don't want to be seen as apologists for China. They don't mm -hmm. want to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, viewed as as too too liberal or too progressive or too radical or something like that. Uh, and and so there's a there's a tendency to, uh, I think, to to reproduce. Uh, to internalize a lot of the the things that that we hear in the mainstream media, even though I think many of these people they've lived and worked in China, they 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 certainly have relationships with Chinese people. They must understand on some level that there's a there's a, a gulf between what is said here about China and and the realities there. But but you know, as again I say, I, I can't speculate on people's subjectivity, but I do think that uh, it, I would I would prefer if more people uh, in the academic community were willing to speak up uh, a little more in defense of China. Uh, China is not perfect. It's not, you know, it's not a, a flawless society. It's not some worker's paradise. It's a, it's a country like any place else, and they're trying to do the best they can. Uh, I think basically they're on, on, on a pretty positive trajectory. But, you know, and certainly there are problems and contradictions uh, that the Chinese are very aware of themselves. And I think that that what we need is an attitude towards China of what I call critical support, that we support China, we defend the positive, the progressive things. Uh, but we also recognize that there, there are problems. We just don't buy into the critique of China that says that there's only problems and they're so bad that China needs to be you know, somehow changed and transformed. We need to foment some kind of color revolution or something like that. China needs to be able to go about its business. The Chinese people will will create their future. And, uh, and they seem to be doing a pretty reasonable job of that. Ken Hammond, professor of East Asian and global history at New Mexico State University and an activist with the organization Pivot to Peace, which has been doing excellent work. I recommend everybody check out the Pivot to Peace uh, website. Thank you so much for joining us and helping us break all this down. It's been a great pleasure to chat.